Greetings friends. Here we are approaching the end of what many Christians know as Holy Week. I hope that this has been a rewarding time of reflection for you on the passion of our Lord. My message this morning is titled The Lamb of God. And so I want to begin by going back right to the beginning. When the first two people, Adam and Eve, chose to disobey and to, and to live without God, they brought guilt, pain and suffering into the world. God had warned them about this and yet when they walked away from God, he also gave a promise to them and by extension to us. His promise was that he would take it upon himself to fix what they had broken. One day, out of his deep love, he would make it possible to come back into a relationship with him. You see, God's nature is love, and he loves to show his love and to extend mercy. Now, someone might ask, if he really is a God of love, why didn't he just overlook their sin and give them a second chance? Why didn't he simply extend mercy and overlook the wrong? Well, he couldn't simply overlook the sin because God is also just. We humans too have an inner sense of justice because we're made in his image. However, God's justice is part of who he is, so he had to do something with sin. He had to do what was just. He had to require accountability for sin. It seems then, at least from a human perspective, that God was in a no-win situation, almost as if he was at war with himself, balancing his love for us with the need for justice. You see, here was the dilemma. As recorded in the first part of Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death. The problem was further compounded. You see, we are not naturally holy. And as the latter part of Hebrews 12.14 tells us, Anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. The problem is our deeds are ugly. Our words are harsh. We don't do or say what we ought to, and we don't like what we do. But even worse, we're powerless to change. Try as we might, we might spin our wheels and we go nowhere. The prophet Jeremiah puts his finger on the problem. Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can a leopard take away its spots? Neither can you start doing good, for you have always done evil. And there's the problem right there. We're accustomed to doing evil. Yet God had promised to correct what the human race had broken, to provide a way for us to come back to him. Throughout the Bible, a sacrificial lamb is used as a symbol of human redemption. In the book of Genesis, God covered Adam and Eve with animal skins, which hints that some kind of sacrifice had taken place. When God led Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he gave them the worship practice of sacrificing lambs. Before the very first Passover, they were instructed to, to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they ate the lambs. The blood became a sign for Israel to remember that the death angel had passed over their houses and that it wouldn't invoke a death penalty of the firstborn in that house. Now this wasn't a one-time activity. God gave Israel a whole sacrificial system that involved the daily, weekly, monthly and yearly sacrifice of lambs and it became an integral part of their life and their culture. In the New Testament, the theme about lambs and sin continues. The Apostle John records that when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward the Jordan River, he said, John 1 verse 29, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, and when he died and rose again as an atonement for all human sin, the need for animal sacrifices, which had always pointed to him, came to an end. The author of Hebrews attributes these next words to the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, verses 17 to 18. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more, and where these have been forgiven, 
there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. The same chapter tells us that the Mosaic law, with all of its sacrifices, was only a shadow of the good things to come, not the reality themselves. And by the Father's will, verse 10, a few verses back, adds, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. The law pointed to Jesus. In the last book of the New Testament, the Apostle John wrote, Revelation 13 and verse 8, that the Lamb was slain from the creation of the world. John was making the point that the sacrifice of Jesus was once for all. It potentially included everyone who has ever lived, Old Testament saints and new. In other words, the effect of Jesus' sacrifice is just the same as if he were sacrificed in any time period in which human beings have lived. Today we are saved by the same sacrifice that saves human beings throughout all time. From the Garden of Eden, to those who live today, and to those who will come after us, we are all under this covenant of grace which spans all of time. As the Apostle Peter says, Jesus is the Lamb whose blood redeems us. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 to 20 For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Salvation comes by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ whose blood redeems us from the consequences of sin. Salvation was never possible through keeping the law, which in any case, every person has utterly failed to keep perfectly, which was in fact the law's requirement. Jesus is not only the creator and judge of all things, he is also the sacrificial lamb, who takes the sins of the world upon himself and forgives them all. He is what the law always pointed to, but could never accomplish in itself. He is, then, both the creator and the redeemer of his universe. He redeemed us at the cross. By that I mean that God's son, Jesus, willingly went to the cross to substitute himself for us, to pay for our sin, and to satisfy the justice of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, the only one who had never sinned, Jesus, took our sin onto himself so that he could give us his righteousness. Jesus did this at the cross. What an exchange. We give him our sin and he pays the penalty for it. In return, he gives us his righteousness or rightness with God. At the cross, God's love was made manifest. His justice was satisfied and his mercy was released. And so God has fulfilled his word without denying who he is. Now we can be forgiven. We can know him and experience his healing love and his power. We, like Adam, came under a curse. But Jesus changed places with us and put himself under that curse, as scripture tells us in Galatians 3.13. I like the way that Max Licato puts it. The sinless one took on the face of a sinner so that we sinners could take on the face of a saint. And we receive all this by faith. We believe in Jesus, the one who died for us. We present ourselves to him in humility, admitting our sin and our need to be forgiven. At that moment, the great exchange takes place. We exchange our sin and pain for his righteousness and life. And with this new life, we enter into his purpose for the world, finding joy and meaning. And yes, this should give us cause for incredible joy. But we don't always feel that way, do we? Someone might ask, how are things going with you today? How are you getting on? And then we respond, now remember this is the same we who have been redeemed from death. We say, well, you know, things could be better. You know, how easy it is for us to become so focused on what we don't have that we become blind 
to what we do have. And we're all guilty of this. We need to get a dose of reality. As Locato also comments, We have been given a ticket to heaven no thief can take, an eternal home no divorce can break. Every sin of our life has been cast to the sea. Every mistake we've made is nailed to the tree. We're blood bought and heaven made, a child of God forever saved. So be grateful, joyful, for isn't it true? We recently observed Palm Sunday. In the week prior to Jesus' death, he had been welcomed into Jerusalem as a king with loud hosannas. Amazingly, many of the same people who had welcomed him on that occasion would shortly after be banged for his crucifixion. So let's look at one of the events prior to Jesus' death. On the night before his arrest, Jesus began to wash his disciples' feet. But Peter was shocked at the idea of this and he refused to let Jesus do this for him. The Apostle John records the story in John 13, verses 6 to 8. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Pugnacious Peter, Ixne on the oshing way, he cried. To give him a little credit, Peter must have been thinking that this kind of humility and servitude was not worthy of the Lord. And you know, throughout the centuries, ever since Jesus' death and resurrection, people have kind of reacted the same way. We human beings seem to prefer keeping God at arm's length. Most of us seem to be more comfortable with God's holiness and power than we are with his humanity and his love. The God who suffers with those who suffer, who bends down to serve, whose strength is revealed in weakness, is usually not the kind of God people are looking for. But such vulnerability on the part of God is something that is wonderfully liberating, but it is also terribly threatening. It's threatening because it unmasks our own weakness and vulnerability. We would rather act as if there is no lack, as if there is no need in our lives, no broken or dark places. So we try to hide our sins because we are threatened by the image of God as judge. But the crucified God shows us a God who is not a threat to us. In Jesus, God was stripped, beaten and bloodied so we could finally see how much God loves us so that without fear we can come to him as we really are. Of course, Jesus, the crucified lamb, is also the judge of all things. And this is the heart of this wonderful paradox. God, who is perfect and all-powerful, does something so remarkable that it seems too good to be true. As our judge, he abolished our sins and set us free. He commutes the death sentence which we had coming by taking the penalty upon himself. It's as if, as judge, he declares guilty, guilty, guilty. And then in passing sentence, he then steps down from the bench, cradles us in his arms and says, don't worry, I've got this. I'll pay for this. Look at how Jesus responded to Peter's protest against Jesus washing his feet. John 13, verse 8, the latter part, Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Okay, so it was time for Peter to zip his lips. But no, he then starts arguing. Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. He really didn't get it then, and neither do we sometimes. Jesus shares our humanity. Even though he was God, he was also human, one of us. By sharing in our broken human life, he redeemed it. And now he wants us to share with him in his glorious resurrected life. It doesn't matter how badly we've messed up our lives. Jesus has already taken care of that. And he is reaching out to us to draw us into the very heart of God. The question is, will we put our hand in his and be drawn in? 
Jesus Christ is the one for whom we've been looking. Something terrible has happened and our lives have become broken. But then we turn our lives over to Jesus, who is the master physician of all time, space and humanity. He takes the broken pieces and he puts them back together again. And as amazing as it sounds, he creates something even better than before. We are better than you and of infinitely more worth. So when we look at the cross, what do we see? Do we simply see two pieces of wood? Or do we see represented in this symbol a deed or an action so audacious? On the one hand, incomprehensible, yet on the other hand, so stunningly beautiful in its significance. That through it, the whole world could possibly be saved and the whole of creation redeemed. The Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world for you and for me, that we might live, and moreover, that we might live abundantly. Let's pray. Loving Father, how can words properly express what you have done for us through your very own precious Son, Jesus? Our words seem feeble and altogether insufficient to describe the reality, the beauty and the significance of what he achieved through the work of the cross. Nonetheless, with renewed humility of heart, we offer you our thanks, knowing that your spirit groans within us to express far more than we could ever utter. So let us never forget what was achieved through the cross, and let us use that memory to spur us on to live for him as he leads us into your everlasting presence. In the name of the one who took the nails for us, our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. So thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon. That way you'll be notified whenever we post new content, whether on a desktop, computer, or a mobile device. So that's it from me. Receive that peace which passes all understanding from our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom, and go in peace to serve the Lord this day and always. Amen.